Um, folks, as, as many of you know, I had the incredible, the honor of being mentored by Rabbi Myron Fenster of the Shelter Rock Jewish Center, and he served here as senior interim rabbi. He had a great heart. He was very thoughtful. He had a great sense of humor. And I remember he told me a story that when he and Ricky were away on vacation, they came back to the neighborhood. He was in the supermarket. He saw a member of the congregation and he walked over to the member of the congregation in the supermarket and he said, guess what? We're back. And the other person said, I didn't know you went away. <laughs> so just to fill everybody in. So I, Deanna and I were away and now we're back. And uh, what I would like to do in these next few minutes is just share a few little vignettes, a few stories about our trip away. In so doing, I would like to make some observations about the whole contour of us as a people, of the Jewish people, of how we deal with circumstances where we have less power and how we deal with circumstances where we have more power. Um, spoiler alert, there are problems when we have less power and there are problems when we have more power. So I'm going to start in England. We spent a few days there. I spent a year in England during college. I wanted to take Deanna to see where I studied and we had a chance to do that and that was great. But mostly we spent time in London and we wanted to get into parliament and have a tour and look around and it just didn't work out until the very last day that we were there. So it was 5 p.m. And we saw somebody and there was no one else there and we walked up and we just figured if you don't ask, you don't get, can we come in and, you know, look around? And so they said, well, there are no tours now, but if you'd like, you can come watch the House of Commons in action. We said, okay. So of course you had to go up, security, you walk through, the building is magnificent. So he gets to the top, the nosebleed section of the House of Commons, where there are about 30 other people. Some of them are students, some of them are older, and they're watching the House of Commons in action. And what was the topic? Well, we imagined it could be anything, fixing the sewers in London. Who knows what the topic is going to be? Maybe Brexit, maybe whatever. The topic, when we happened to be there that day, was the creation of a Holocaust museum and education center in London. And I looked at Deanna and I said, like, you know, do I believe that these things are destined, fated? I don't know. The rabbi and his spouse walk in and that's the topic. So I, I know they weren't doing it for my benefit. What was really fascinating was not the details because, my God, they argued, they argue in a way that is louder than the United States Congress, but not quite as loud as the Knesset. It's somewhere on the spectrum. And the arguments were, you know, where do you do it? Who pays for it, et cetera? What was fascinating to me was that both sides of the aisle kept saying over and over, there is no dispute that we need to finally have a national Holocaust uh, museum and center in the United Kingdom. So that was the first vignette that I want to share. Then we flew to Israel and we spent a week there, mostly in Tel Aviv. We spent some time in Ranana with friends of ours. So we spent Shabbat in Ranana and Shabbat is over. And my friend said to me, do you want to go see one of the demonstrations taking place? It takes place um, every Saturday. And so we went and we saw a demonstration against the reforms that have been proposed. And at that time, one of them had not yet been uh, determined, but it has. So the events uh, passed and one of the reforms was actually passed since that demonstration. So here's a couple of interesting things about it. Um, number one, the entire family didn't go. So one of the family members, the spouse, 
Um, she said, I'm not going, was not her thing. She has some different views than her husband does. Within each home in Israel, there are different views about this. It's not just the people writ large. So we went there with two of the children and the husband. And what we saw were people who were standing there. It was very peaceful. And everybody was holding an Israeli flag. Now, that's also significant because the people who are protesting have been accused of not being patriotic towards the state of Israel. These are people who have served in the army. These are people who love Israel. It concluded with Hatikva. Another interesting thing. It started at 6 p.m. on Saturday. What's that about? That was a compromise because a number of people who are Dati, who are self-described religious observant Jews, wanted to participate. They want to demonstrate that there are people who have issue with the direction of the current government who are observant Jews. It's not just people who are secular. The compromise was 6 p.m. as Shabbat is ending so that people who are observant could come when it was completely dark. Now, it's troubling that there is such a disunity that exists in Israel right now. I'm not going to talk about the reforms right now. I'm not going to talk about the merits of each position right now. What I want to reflect on is that there is a fraying of what keeps Israeli society together. And all of us who follow this and all of us who care about Israel and all of us who love Israel should be aware of this and should be aware of the challenge. So generalizing, you have in Israel two groups that right now seem to be becoming increasingly polarized. And each group presents the other. So one is largely liberal, um, largely more affluent than the other, largely located in Tel Aviv and in surrounding communities. The other is more conservative, often less affluent, living in other parts of the country. The first group accuses the second group of supporting the weakening of Israeli democracy, of being racist, of being backward. The second group accuses the first of being elitist, of being crybabies who aren't willing to accept the outcome of a fair and honest election. And there's another element which is really important to understand, and that is there is an Ashkenazi Mizrahi element which is very complicated. So there are many Mizrahi Jews in the second group that resent Ashkenazi Jews for being elitist, for being self-righteous. And there are members of the first group that will look at the second group and have issues with them. But it's not so simple. There are many Mizrahi Jews in Israel that are protesting. And there are many Ashkenazi Jews in Israel that are very happy with what is going on. And there are many families that are mixed. As time goes on, people are marrying each other. And sometimes leaders try to exploit these differences so that they turn people against each other. And that's a problem. So. Where does this take us? I want to just share a few thoughts. I'd love to say, don't worry, it's all going to be fine. And eventually, things probably will be fine. Israel has faced challenges. During the first Lebanon war, there were protests on both sides. This is not the first time. You may have seen on social media, and I urge you to watch it if you haven't seen it, and I will be circulating copies of it with a sermon, a video that was put out by an Israeli artist by the name of Koren Dahan. He lives in Caesarea. His father's family is right-leaning. His mother's family is left-leaning. He has both in his experience and in his so-called DNA. So what's the video? The video consists of two individuals. They're both male. They both served in the army. And they are sitting in a room together and first uh, the more right-leaning one speaks. It's a rap. So, you know, he's speaking in this kind of like rapid fire. And what he's doing is he is sharing all of his criticism of the other side. 
You know, you, 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 you think you know everything. You think that you're the only one who cares about the Declaration of Independence. You know, you think that you can just shut down the country when you don't get your way. Why don't you go to Berlin? If you go to Berlin, you won't have to worry about all the settlers. I mean, it is fierce and it is bitter. And the second person says, you know, you are this and you are that and you are racist and you don't care about democracy. And you accuse me of not being a good Jew, even though I don't observe the way that you do. All of the stuff comes to the surface. It is incredibly powerful in its intensity. Each one begins by saying, I don't hate you, but I have issues with you, deep issues. And they didn't just start today. Now, the very end of this video, um, you'll see it, but I'm telling you because it's powerful. It happens to be Yom HaZikaron, it's Israel's uh, Memorial Day, and they say the siren is about to sound to memorialize all of Israel's fallen soldiers and those who fell in terrorist attacks. And they stand next to each other and they listen to the siren. And when the siren is finished, they hug each other. And that's the end of the video. Very, very powerful. I share this because it's important for us to understand, and it's not surprising. There are resentments that we bring. There are resentments in Israeli society. There's trauma on both sides. At the end of the day, given the opportunity, people do recognize their shared identity as Israelis and as Jews and as human beings, but it's not easy. So I just want to take a little step back and then I'll conclude. So why did I start in England? Why did I tell you the story about the Holocaust Museum that's being created in England? There are perils and challenges to not having enough power. And there are perils and challenges to having more power. We have experienced the downside to having not enough power power, being at the mercy, whether it's the king of Morocco, who we heard about last night in a beautiful presentation, or the outcome of so-called democratic governments in Europe that have led to a very dark place for the Jewish people. There is also peril to having power. You have to figure out how to run the society. You have to figure out how you're going to deal with minorities. You're going to have to figure out how you're going to deal with human rights. And the perils of that can lead to very, very different views on how things should be done that reflect different perspectives. And they can get to a place that is angry and even dark. And I will say now, and I will say it to whoever is listening, and I will shout it from the rooftop, I would far rather have to deal with the downside, the challenges of having power as a people than of not having power as a people. God forbid that we ever have to go back to a place where we are dependent upon the whims of rulers or of political outcomes. Israel is complicated. It raises all kinds of emotional and spiritual and political questions. However, thank God that it exists. Thank God that people can demonstrate in the streets and criticize each other publicly and not be, God forbid, arrested or executed or worse, which is done elsewhere in countries not very far from Israel. And uh, lastly, I want to just express my hope that our people will be able to find points of unity, points of humanity, and not just when we are being threatened from outside, to be able to recognize our shared humanity just when things are quote unquote average and normal. And I want to conclude with a story which I was not part of and which I did not witness, but it was recorded. There were a number of protesters who were going from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and it has been very hot in Israel this summer as it has been elsewhere. So these protesters are walking and they are sweating, and a few individuals 
Haredi women, ultra-Orthodox women, noticed that people were perspiring, that they seemed like they were distressed, and they walked around and handed out water, bottles of water, to these protesters. And one of them said to one of the protesters, I don't think that I agree with you, but there might be something that I can learn from you. And I would say, observing this, seeing it, reading about it, that there is surely something that that protester can learn from that woman as well. So those are my stories. And this is my hope that we as a people will be able to embrace the benefits of having power and influence over our fate and over others. And that while we are embracing those benefits, we will be able to find points of unity with each other. Shabbat Shalom.